Let me tell you a tale. It took place 360,000... No, 14,000 years ago. Well, to me it seems like only yesterday. To you, it could be tomorrow. Hello viewer. Take a look at this beautiful El Shaddai footage while I talk about something unrelated. Since we're at the start, maybe I should break the ice by telling you about my personal life in order to endear you to me. Or maybe I should wait until the end so you're more inclined to subscribe or donate. You probably noticed I don't normally make those kinds of appeals, but I could. If I wanted to, I could address you at any point. Sometimes I kind of do. Occasionally I use phrases like, if you ask me, or if you're anything like me, where we almost have a dialogue. The main reason I do that is because using the pronoun one instead of you sounds a bit strange with my accent. One requires a more pompous tone for that to sound natural. Anyway, interacting with you is the point of these videos and yet I usually have a sort of barrier between us, as though I'm actually talking to a brick wall or something which is their reality as I record this. Of course, I don't know who you are, but this video must be watched to be understood, so I know the only way these words have meaning is because someone is there to hear them. It's kind of like when you're not sure if you're alone, so you go, I know you're listening. Because there's nothing to lose, either someone really is there to hear you or else nobody can witness you embarrassing yourself. Except you, of course. Anyway, you could be anyone, but at the very least I can say you're listening to me as I speak. By now, you probably think this is all a bit strange or tiresome, but that's only because of the way I've phrased this and how unusual it is for me. If I did it more casually and more often, you'd think it was normal. I'd be a vlogger. Here's an example of what that might sound like. <clears throat> That's the old uh, fake throat clearing, so you know we've switched over to a different style of delivery. Anyway, the thing I wanted to say is I tend to relate everything to games, so right now I'm thinking about the intro video to Metal Gear Solid 2. You know, it opens up with all these historical ways that information has been recorded, you know, writings or carvings or that or whatever else. And then it contrasts that against stuff like double helixes and code and chemical diagrams. So you end up with this impression that basically everything is information when you break it down enough. Of course, one of the themes of the game is how humans have this ability to interpret information or choose which information we pass on from one to another, which is basically what we're doing right now. See, that wasn't so weird, was it? Ahem. <clears throat> Here's a dirty secret about creativity. Meta is easy. Meta might just be the easiest thing you can do. Actors spend their whole careers resisting the urge to look at the camera. Going meta just means giving in to those natural temptations. Meta might seem clever, as deep as an endlessly recursive hole, but I think it's more like an infinity mirror, surprisingly easy to set up and gives the illusion of depth by just reflecting back on itself. That perceived cleverness makes Meta a highly prized gimmick, which means if you want to min-max the effort to pay off ratio, there's no better way than Meta. Assuming you're at least somewhat interested in game design, which is hopefully the case if you're watching this, then I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to play an idler like Cookie Clicker here for at least an hour or two. Don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're hidden gems or anything, but they do illustrate a point about game design in general. If one were to ask me, clickers bear the most resemblance to the RPG genre. Play something like Final Fantasy or Diablo, and a large part of the appeal is finally reaching that next level you've been anticipating. Things tend to be measured in experience points, with little bars displaying progress you can grind towards. Somewhere along the way, these elements, which used to be exclusive to RPGs, began to migrate outwards, slowly permeating everything. At this point, that assimilation seems more or less complete. Now many games have something similar, level up to increase your damage or get a new loot box or just so your icon will look a little more fancy. In some cases these leveling systems don't even affect the gameplay at all which leads to the question of why they exist in the first place. The answer is pretty obvious. People used to play Quake 3 all the time just because they enjoyed it, it didn't need anything else to keep them hooked. Now if we imagine two identical versions of Quake happen to release on the same day, one with a progress system and one without, it's easy to guess which one would win a larger player base, even if both audiences were still small. While some players won't care about the difference, others will be drawn to the progression system, in which case that version has a greater chance of surviving, while the more minimalist one fades into irrelevancy. Economics fuel much of this problem, with a progression system comes unlockables and with unlockables comes microtransactions to acquire them immediately. That income can be used to extend development, updating the game with more content, providing a feedback loop of success. This probably doesn't come as a surprise to you, but there's a more sinister way of thinking about it which you may not have struck upon yet. In a sense, 
Games are evolving to exploit us. Even if no individual person agrees that progression systems are a good thing, they tap into a simple desire we all have to one degree or another. If you're a fan of the Metal Gear series, then I don't have to explain the true meaning of the word meme to you, but for everyone else, a quick rundown. The basic premise is that ideas are a little like genes. Successful ones get passed down to future generations, while unsuccessful ones disappear. Keep in mind, this doesn't mean the idea is beneficial or detrimental to humanity, just that it perpetuates itself somehow. Progression systems could be seen as a successful meme, which will be difficult to eradicate. Ironically, even the Metal Gear series itself fell prey to this particular trend. Now that most games have something like this, it's hard to envision how another game can compete without it. Even if you create something enjoyable enough to survive without this meme, someone else can come along, create a clone of your game, slap a progression system on it and steal your audience. Much like clickbait, it's a selection pressure that will seemingly never go away anymore. If one were to ask me, that doesn't excuse developers or critics who rely on such tactics, but it's a reality we need to confront sooner or later. On paper, wouldn't we all agree that getting better at a game yourself is much more rewarding than pretending you've gotten better by unlocking more upgrades? It's worth examining whether your behaviour aligns with your answer to that question. This is why playing an idler can be beneficial, because there's few better ways to break the spell than to confront the absurdity of it all. After you've baked a billion cookies per second, killing a skeleton for 25 XP doesn't hold quite as much significance. Despite how it might seem at times, games aren't the shit you pick up while you play them. The actual game is what happens in between those moments. When you recognise that just clicking on a cookie and watching the number increment can be enjoyable, you recognise that there's something exploitable about the way many of us are wired. As a species, we have these collective weaknesses and now more than ever, games are tapping into them, so either you make a conscious effort to push back or get rolled over like so much squashed dough. Around the time I released my comparison of Axiom Verge and Environmental Station Alpha, Hollow Knight was reaching the height of its popularity. Naturally, comments arrived saying it would be great if I reviewed Hollow Knight next. This wasn't a surprise, but I had already considered the idea and decided to do these two instead. In fact, that video began its life as a comparison between many different Metroid-style games. It's a subgenre I'm very familiar with, and I played even more of them as research, but in the end it came down to just Axiom Verge and Station Alpha, because to me they represented two ends of a spectrum. If you imagine Super Metroid somewhere in the middle, it's obvious that Axiom Verge is more about doubling down on the discovery element of that game. You get weird new skills, see weird new places, and never really know what's going to come next. By contrast, Station Alpha is more straightforward, but it offers a better challenge, which enhances the feeling of being dropped into a harsh alien landscape while struggling to stay alive. If you watch my comparison, you'll see there's more nuance to both games, but that's about the gist of it. Hollow Knight falls much more firmly into that second category. It doesn't have any groundbreaking skills or reveals, but it does have a close-range weapon which is used to fight a lot of good bosses. It's not as though there's nothing more to be said about Hollow Knight. The map system in particular is noteworthy. While there might be some better iteration on this idea waiting to be discovered, it's nice to see a developer address the problem of players spending too much time staring at a map rather than the actual contents of the world. This is something I'd be happy to see exported to other entries in the genre. Conversely, while I'd be perfectly fine without any RPG elements in these games, I think the charm system presented a reasonable enough middle ground. It offers meaningful options without a bunch of boring number crunching or excessive menu use. On the whole, I think Hollow Knight's appeal lies mostly in being less bad rather than more good, which is fine, but doesn't make it a great example for exploring the genre conceptually. There's always more to say about any given game, but my point is, these videos have never been about telling you what to think, and I hope they're not just about what I think either. They're supposed to be an exploration of what makes games work one game at a time. The reason I've historically focused on individual titles is because I believe an identical mechanic might be beneficial in one, but detrimental in another, even if those two games seem similar on a surface level. No matter how popular certain trends might be, there's always an opportunity for a phenomenal game to come along which flouts convention. I'm, I'm not sure, sure an exceptional game, game has ever been made just by following a blueprint. blueprint. Preconceptions about good game design or bad game design are just shortcuts which happen to arrive at the correct answer more often than not. This is why a good test requires you to write down your process along with the answer, because you can't be sure you'll get the next one right unless you know how to derive the solution. Leveling up your intelligence is good, but make sure to put some points in wisdom as well.
The Witness can be enjoyed solely for its cornucopia of puzzles, but there is a thematic layer to be uncovered. Those familiar with the concept of mindfulness may make a connection between the audiovisual logs and the second layer of puzzles as a way of understanding one of this game's major themes. Basically, the present moment, with all its sensory experience, can be obscured by a distracted mind in much the same way those other puzzles remain hidden until you take the time to simply observe. More specifically, one might say the different types of puzzles show how the practical and transcendental can coexist. Maybe you have a different interpretation, but just for the sake of argument imagine I'm right and that this is what Jonathan Blow was thinking about as he constructed the island. Why is that worthwhile? And no, this isn't some shot at the witness, I mean, why bother conveying an idea this way at all? It was seven years between the release of Braid and The Witness, during which time I assume Jonathan worked pretty hard. Multiple people were involved in its construction, it required a lot of specialised knowledge to create, and yet if I'm right, I've been able to tell you the core idea in under a minute. Of course I can't recapture all of the nuances, but it is possible to communicate in a more direct, more efficient way. Like it or not, at least some of the value in art comes not just from the particular way it explores its ideas, but also the way it obscures them. Don't take my word for it though, here's some writing advice from the robot devil. Your lyrics lack subtlety. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. One actually can have one's characters announce how they feel, and not just for the sake of comedy. Thought bubbles are a common device in comics, but one story will be expected to make this up some other way, like visual symbolism. Every medium has its own versions of this problem, but why do we want this layer of abstraction? Is it the knowledge of being in an exclusive club of people who get it? Is it the implied respect a creator has for an audience they're willing to challenge? Is it just masturbatory? Maybe it's all of the above and more. My theory is that we need a certain level of difficulty between us and the actual substance of the experience simply to keep us mentally engaged. When we're not clicking cookies, we're comparatively smart creatures, so unless our faculties are being taxed, our minds are more likely to wander away from whatever the creator was attempting to express. Hey, pay attention. When you think about it this way, all that highbrow symbolism, the show, don't tell approach exists for a surprisingly lowbrow reason. I suppose the game equivalent of Fry's dialogue might be a simple text-based tutorial which spoils the mechanics of its game, something The Witness sought to rectify. You can't just announce how your game works, that makes me feel bored. A game's quality can be assessed from any angle, but hopefully we can all agree that it would be misguided to review Sekiro as though it were a puzzle game. That notion is absurd, because every game is bad in an endless number of things, and only good in the few ways it was crafted to be. Sekiro is a terrible racing game, it has no turn-based strategy, and it's a lacklustre platformer. Rather than critiquing it for failing in those areas, we're better off examining it based on what it does well. That might sound too lenient, but we can invoke similar games as a guideline for what level of quality can be expected. When I first started reviewing games, I would try to imagine what the developers were going for and judge it based on those merits. This isn't the right reasoning, but it was close to being the right approach. In order to begin critiquing something, what you need more than anything else is a reference point. Imagine you spent your entire life blind up until this very instant. If I locked you in a room with Sekiro the moment you gained vision, you'd be able to play it, but would you be able to give an adequate review? Nobody could stop you from relaying your subjective experience, and it might even be interesting to hear such a unique perspective, but it probably wouldn't provide a useful assessment for those of us with decades of experience to pull from. In all likelihood, you'd be far more impressed by the graphics than anyone else, which would be totally justifiable from your perspective, but not useful information. There could be all kinds of things you don't know about games, like the fact that guards could follow snowy footsteps as early as the PS1, or that some titles drop the pretense of being anything but a boss rush. Comparisons like this can be helpful because every game is ultimately competing against every other game for a player's time. When I would imagine what the developers were going for, what I was really doing was drawing on a lifetime of knowledge to arrive at the most charitable interpretation of a game. Doesn't always sound that way, given how pedantic I can be at times, but if I can find fault with Devil Daggers or Oberdin, then nothing is going to emerge unscathed. My point is, in order to know what a game is good at, you have to know what games are capable of. You need a baseline, and the more you play, the more accurate your baseline becomes. I would even say that playing games alone isn't enough. After all, it seems foolish to review a visual novel without ever having read a book. If one were to ask me, I'd say there's a lot more to a good critic than just consuming a bunch of media, but it's a necessary part of the equation. 
Perhaps this theory sounds flawed, or as though it could just be one of many approaches to criticism. For example, you might be thinking it's not my place to decide what a game is good at. There's definitely gaps in my knowledge, and we're all capable of making mistakes. Maybe it really is less than ideal. Maybe there is a more detached way of reviewing everything. But I'm going to assert that such an assessment is beyond the grasp of human beings. In order to refute that claim, you'd have to come up with an alternate explanation for why nobody has reviewed Sekiro as a puzzle game. The real answer is obvious, because it's not a good puzzle game. Everybody knows that already, so instead we focus on the aspects we think are actually noteworthy instead, which can vary from person to person depending on their experience. Unless you're willing to go through an infinite list of comparisons to every other game and genre in existence, these implicit judgments happen in every review because something always gets left out. What gets omitted or focused on tells you as much about the critic as it does about the game. Game criticism is beginning to face an insurmountable problem. A person born in 2020 stands no chance of being able to play all of the titles we currently consider classics by the time they're old enough to become a critic. We could go as far back as Space War for a thorough understanding of gaming history, but even starting with Space Invaders, you're looking at over 40 years of releases. By comparison, film critics have it easy. They have a longer history to explore, but even the three hour runtime of Amadeus is short compared to an average game. Not to mention that a film is the same every time, whereas part of fully experiencing a game is seeing how it might diverge on subsequent playthroughs. Thanks to an abundance of lengthy RPGs and a proliferation of RPG mechanics into non-RPGs, the average completion time across single player releases maybe stretches past the 20 hour mark. Right now, an average working week in a developed country is about 40 to 50 hours. That's enough time to watch roughly 20 movies if you set your mind to it, or alternatively, you could get less than halfway through an RPG. And keep in mind, that's just a single playthrough. This job is time consuming, especially if you want to do it well. As of now, I have over 100 hours in Dust Force with a couple of levels left unfinished. I spent months producing three hour commentaries to Devil May Cry and Beautiful Joe while learning new things about them right away to the end. It took me over 200 hours just to play Breath of the Wild enough to do a review, and the Legend of Zelda series has nearly 20 mainline installments by now. There's a lot of elements common to most of the series, like heart containers, sword play, dungeons and minigames. Even though these can cause the series to feel a little samey, especially considering how many installments there are, the Zelda games are not afraid of change. Even though I've done almost nothing but play games since I could hold a controller, I've had a lot of difficulty keeping up. I'm still not as familiar with shoot 'em ups fighting games or CRPGs as I'd ideally like to be, but I think I arrived at a time when it was possible to dig into stuff from before my birth while still staying abreast of new releases. If one were to ask me, it all really begins with the so-called golden age of arcade games. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Defender, Qbert, Frogger, Donkey Kong and so on. It might seem frivolous to play all of these games as research, but I can name much more obscure ones which have directly influenced, or are at least suspiciously similar, to later releases. Many of us have at least dabbled with classical music on a rainy afternoon, so one might be familiar with names such as Mozart, Chopin and Satie. To us, this is all classical music, but actually none of those men were even alive at the same time. This is like putting Shigeru Miyamoto in the same category as a person who won't even be born for another hundred years. Thankfully, knowledge of history can be crowdsourced to all of humanity, but even this collective memory has its limits. Over time, the past gets more and more compressed until only the most important points remain. You can think of every classic as a peak on a mountain. The tide keeps rising, drowning out all the lower peaks. As the water gets higher, the average distance between peaks just keeps getting wider. To the casual music listener, most of Mozart's contemporaries, like Salieri, have drowned, and someday he might too. Of course, Mozart's creativity lives on in all the things that were inspired by him, and even if the man himself is forgotten someday, his influence on history will remain immeasurable. Still, I feel privileged to have lived at a time when a single person could have comprehensive experience with the entire medium of games. Some genuinely amazing titles, like Alien Soldier, are already struggling to stay afloat in the collective consciousness. Give it a hundred years and even dedicated critics probably won't have time to explore the Mega Drive's library for themselves. Keep in mind, new Mega Drive games are still being released and the rate of total releases for all platforms has increased over time. There will come a day when some prominent critic won't even know what a Mega Drive was. 
In that future, they'll have to rely on retro specialists to highlight the best games available for each old platform. This necessitates a certain level of cooperation and trust. You have to place your faith in those specialists to do their job well. If you happen to be listening to this from the world of tomorrow, then you might pity me for the games I never got a chance to play, but there was an advantage to living now. I've completed a comparatively large percentage of the total games ever released. Given the amount of shovelware, that number might not even crack 1%, but it's relatively high, higher than it ever will be for subsequent generations. There's something reassuring about having such a self-contained baseline. If games have taught me anything, it's that the good guys have a way of winning in the end, but it doesn't happen without struggle. Highlighting the truly outstanding titles of today is a necessity to avoid stagnation, because everything stands on the shoulders of what came before. If we can all help the cream rise to the top, then we'll all collectively benefit from better games in the long term too. Good news everyone, I have a convoluted and dated metaphor to explain. Games are like pennies, in the take a penny, leave a penny tray. Some developers leave a cent behind, whereas others are just grabbing whatever they can. Growing up on restrictive JRPGs like Final Fantasy VII, I had initially assumed that the role play in RPG meant that players had to take on the role of a fixed character, like Cloud, who despite having dialogue options from time to time, clearly had his own backstory and personality to some degree. In other words, my goal was to think like Cloud. It seems stupid now, but in my defence I was only a kid at the time. Often, these kinds of choices are surface level, only having the bare minimum acknowledgement before resuming the prescribed route every player will take. Western RPGs were much better in this regard, they might be the first games to leave a penny instead of taking one, but my experience with them was more limited and even so they could sometimes be guilty of the same things. One overlooked aspect of the Soul series is its commitment to a single save file, which means that a player's action, or even inaction, can lead to dire permanent consequences. I'd be lying if I said I understood that from the moment I began playing Demon Souls, but it did manage to pull me in and make me take it more seriously than usual thanks to its grounded tone and punishing checkpoints. Over time, I came to understand that my actions really were affecting the world to some degree because rescued NPCs would appear in the Nexus. Having that experience behind me, when Dark Souls rolled around, you better believe I took every choice seriously. It's RPGs like Fallout, or maybe even adventure games like Zork, which deserve credit for pioneering this approach to choice and consequence. That lineage continues through spiritual successors, but nowadays these ideas might be best represented by games like Undertale or One Shot. Wherever it happens, we all know that narrative divergences based on a player's actions can be engaging, but my penny analogy isn't really about any single game. I'm saying that these developers left a penny because their games have a positive effect on the entire medium. Without prior knowledge, it's impossible to know whether or not a game will honour decisions before playing it. Once you know that a thoughtless response to dialogue really can lead to drastic consequences, you're more likely to be cautious next time, even if you're playing an entirely different game. In other words, anyone who plays a game with choice and consequence ironically has no choice but to assume their decisions will matter in the next game they play, even if those two games are unrelated. Other media have a similar duality with good and bad endings. If every film had a happy ending, then there'd be no stakes. We need the downers, not just to explore that side of life, but also to make the happy endings more meaningful. Likewise, games which present the illusion of choice and consequence are simply taking pennies. They're riding on the coattails of others, because if those other developers didn't go to those extra lengths, then everyone would see through the illusion. We mainly play along because we've been conditioned by those games which punish or reward certain choices, and in so doing, they leave a penny for another game to take. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the second in a series of five reviews that I'm doing on The Legend of Zelda. If you haven't watched any of these videos before, then I'd recommend starting with my Ocarina of Time video instead. In this video, I'll be talking about Majora's Mask in depth, so spoilers for the entire game will follow. They say every cell in your body is replaced over the course of seven years. Seems to be an exaggeration, but it's a good excuse to praise my own Majora's Mask review since it was practically done by a different person. As far as I'm concerned, the most salient point I made in the God of War case study was that the, the amount, amount of effort, effort put, put into, into something, something doesn't, doesn't necessarily determine its quality. There must be some kind of relationship between the two, and I certainly labour under the assumption that there is, but occasionally you just strike it lucky or strike out. You would not believe the amount of effort I put into my antechamber review considering how forgettable it is. 
At the time I made this video, it had by far the most work put into it per minute of any video up to that point, but the end result is boring. In a way, that was valuable because I resolved never to make a video that dull again, and to this day I think I've lived up to that ideal. If I were to make my Majora's Mask review now, I'd probably put five times as much effort into it than I did back then, but despite that, the end result holds up pretty well, I think. There's a nice bit of serendipity here because Majora's Mask itself was made on a blisteringly fast timescale compared to other Zelda games, yet it too holds up pretty well. The bit towards the end of my review where I play the final hours music while discussing the atmosphere and its value as a sequel is something I'd still be happy to have produced today and probably justifies the video's existence by itself. More importantly for me, this was the moment when I realised my reviews could reflect the game they talked about, something I try to sneak in wherever possible. It's not a coincidence that the Sonic Dreams collection one is overtly funny, or that Nobunobi Boy's intrusion on Death Stranding could be described as Quantum Brow. It's a nice challenge to try to capture the essence of a game through an analytical format, but it's important not to stray too far into that territory, otherwise the analysis becomes a pale imitation of the thing it's discussing. Even the most immaculately crafted exploration of a game's standout element could never substitute for actually playing that game. The real value of analysis is just to put vague concepts into words, because words are like a mental handhold. Once you get a grip of something using language, that grip feels more secure, somehow. Even so, no matter how much a game might be understood on an intellectual level, there remains an ineffable qualia provided by interactivity which can't be experienced second hand. Don't fool yourself into thinking otherwise. Anyway, the delusion that more work leads to a better product can be so strong I wouldn't be surprised if at least some of the Majora's Mask team refuse to believe it's actually as good as fans say. Even if they feel that way, they'll probably never admit as much, which is a valid course of action. As you might imagine, I've been doing this job long enough that I'm not entirely happy with some of the things I made in the past, but as long as I don't say what I don't like about them, then your perception won't be tainted by that knowledge. This is just baseless speculation, but maybe with an extra year of development, all those Ocarina of Time NPCs would have been replaced by fresh character models. It's not hard to imagine them second-guessing that decision if given more time to think about it, but from my perspective, that would be a tragedy. Seeing those familiar faces in a different situation only adds to the unsettling atmosphere. Similarly, maybe you like something about an older video of mine that I don't. Maybe you think I lost my way somewhere. Given the sheer number of people I've attracted over the years, there must be at least one former fan who no longer cares enough to even watch this video. I would tell them there's no hard feelings, but they'll never hear this anyway. No matter which direction you go, you lose some people along the way. Trying to avoid that just leads to stagnation, which eventually has the same result. The way I see it, if there's no hope of holding on to everyone, then there's no point worrying about it. That's one reason why I like the Zelda series so much, because even though some installments resonate more or less with me, they always seem willing to alienate a portion of the audience in pursuit of something better. Speaking from experience, I can say this isn't done out of malice, some people just prefer to challenge themselves. That desire for improvement is part of what draws us to games in the first place. If you've ever wondered, I don't find criticism to be creatively satisfying, which might explain why I've resorted to a weirder format like this one. That said, regardless of how I feel, criticism is creative work. It just unfortunately happens to be creative work where the creativity is the least important part. Some clever editing or a well-timed joke might help a viewer pay more attention, but it's the observations and explanations that count at the end of the day. In case you haven't figured it out, this is advice for you aspiring analysts out there. Good analysis doesn't have to be difficult to read or watch, but it will sometimes be difficult to make. Steer away from that difficulty too hard, and you'll end up with plenty of style, but no substance. Here's a dirty secret about creativity. <laughs> Much of it is just seizing on connections you don't really feel responsible for. You might be wondering why you're watching Futurama right now. Brace yourself for this one because it's going to blow your mind, unless you're re-watching the video, in which case you already know what I'm about to say. Futurama was the inspiration for micro videos. It had nothing to do with WarioWare in the beginning. Back in 2017, I was watching this Anthology of Interest episode, which is a series of short stories. You watched it. You can't unwatch it. Stay tuned for more Tales of Interest. Not only was WarioWare not the inspiration, it wasn't even planned to be in the first collection. Initially, I was going to split them into sets of five, and WarioWare was about the eighth or ninth one I wrote. In the end, I changed my mind, thinking that a longer runtime would help the micro-video concept shine. 
if I hadn't made that decision, then this whole thing wouldn't have kicked off with Wario. Hard to even imagine that now. That was a little difficult to admit because it's probably going to have an effect on how you view all this, but let's break down what actually happened. First of all, it's not a blind coincidence that I wrote a micro video about WarioWare of all things. I had wanted to do a recommendation of it for quite a while, but didn't feel there was enough material to write a longer script. At the same time, I also wanted to squeeze in a recommendation as a micro video because recommending stuff is one of my favourite parts of the job. WarioWare is obviously the perfect fit, which didn't take me long to figure out. It was only when I decided to go beyond five videos at a time that all the pieces fell into place. Now WarioWare was part of the first collection and the question was what the track listing should be. Maybe it should be a really short one that goes in the middle as a sort of rhythm breaker. Or maybe it should be the very first one. Cut and paste Wario to the top of the script and suddenly the light bulb moment happens. Voila, Mega Micro Videos is born. Apart from the fact that it all started with Futurama, each step in the chain is logical, and yet in a way, it feels tremendously lucky. As if that wasn't enough, the Katamari closer wasn't part of the initial plan either. Originally I was going to close on Zero Time Dilemma, but decided to delay that one as Mega Micro Videos 2 was conceptualised. Katamari happened to be the last one left, partly because I ordered them in what I consider to be ascending levels of spoilers. Most people know how the final levels of a Katamari game play out by now, but I figured if I could preserve it as a surprise for at least one person, it was worth saving until the end. Again, I realised how appropriate it was to tie everything up into that Katamari observation about combining order and chaos, but the process which took me there seems a little meandering. If you're not a creatively minded person, this must sound like a damning condemnation of myself. I must be a woeful hack who just stumbled his way into something good. That is, assuming you think Mega Micro Videos is good in the first place, if not, I have to wonder what you're still doing here. Really though, I'm just exposing something that exists everywhere. If you think less of Mega Micro Videos now that I've divulged those secrets, then you should be prepared to think less of everything you've ever consumed. A similar event must have happened at least once in the making of your favourite game. If I had to bet, I'd say that any creator putting in the time runs up against a situation like this every day if you define it broadly enough. We can't control the circumstances around us or the connections formed in our own minds, so all that's really left is just seizing the good while letting the bad drift away. I think the most important skill to making something worthwhile is just recognising when you actually have something good. If you know your work is subpar, you're driven to improve it. If you know it's acceptable, you won't throw it away. Repeat that self-reflection process enough times and the other details hardly matter. You might not end up with what you expected, but at least you end up with something good. Maybe something better than you imagined in the first place. Anyway, I'm thankful for the process which led us here, but before I finish rolling up this Katamari, I want to say what I think is the most important thing you'll ever hear. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe.